right, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Georgia chapter of HFMA. I'm Laurie Hebe, I'm a Georgia HFMA Education Committee volunteer. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, I've mentioned in the past, starting in June, we're going to be reverting from the weekly webinars that we've been doing in April and May, and we're going to be uh, going back to hosting two a month. And we do have uh, webinars already set for June 10th and June 17th, so be, please be watching your email for, for that information. We're also going to team with other chapters in our region to host a monthly virtual education day, and uh, that's in the very early planning stages, but more to come on that. And then tomorrow, please be sure to join us for our virtual networking at 5 p.m. Eastern. If you're not registered for that virtual event, please check the Georgia HFMA website, the events calendar to register. And also, if you're joining us for the first time for our webinar series, I really encourage you to check the website to hear recordings from our previous sessions. Like I said, we've been doing um, uh, weekly webinars uh, since April, so there's a ton of great content for you related to COVID-19, related to um, patient and, uh, financial engagement, just a lot of stuff. So I encourage you to go out to our website and, and take a look. We have presentations and recordings. Today's session, uh, we're going to be highlighting social determinants of change, revenue cycle management's role as an agent of change. But before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. As you know, uh, everyone will be on mute to avoid interruptions during the broadcast. Please just submit your questions via the question box at any time, and I'll coordinate with Rodney for his answers at the end of the presentation. I'm also going to uh, uh, put in the chat box a link to where you can download the presentation and, um, and I'll give you the navigation on the Georgia HFMA website where you can get that now. And then also you'll want to check this uh, site. We'll post the recording of today's session in that same location. Everyone on today's call is eligible to receive continuing education credit. Be on the lookout for this form. I'll send it to you in email. It will come from me from my email address. Um, lhev at clearbalance.org, and you'll be able to use this form to self-submit for your credit on the HFMA website under the Membership Info tab. Now it's my pleasure to introdu introduce our speaker today. Rodney Napier is the Vice President of Enterprise Development for Invicta Health Solutions. The team at Invicta provides advanced technology and innovative service solutions to critical components of the revenue cycle. Rodney has spent his entire 25-year career within the, health, within the healthcare space, and in addition to his revenue cycle experience, he's also acquired notable proficiencies within hospital finance, information technology, marketing, and consulting. Rodney, we're ready to begin. Well, thank you, Lori, uh, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share some interesting and what we believe to be very valuable information on social determinants of health their impact on patients' overall health and well-being, and probably more importantly, why hospitals and revenue cycle professionals should begin to take notice. We're gonna cover a lot of information today, and I think some of the statistics will be surprising um, for people on the call. And eventually we're going to begin comparing Georgia specifically uh, to yourself and some of your neighboring states within Region 5. So I put this in there just as a kind of a, a cautionary uh, slide that some of the statistics and, and things we're going to cover today will create some wow moments and possibly some sad moments. And I think everyone will experience a range of reactions and, and possibly emotions, quite honestly, from wonderment to sadness to enlightenment, uh, acceptance, and then eventually uh, we're hoping ownership. But when we're all done, hopefully you'll feel a, a sense of empowerment uh, and some energy to begin starting down the, the journey and path of calling attention to social determinants of health. So I want to begin with presenting two important theses that by the end of the presentation, I hope we'll all be able to support as true. The first is that by a hospital identifying, addressing, and addressing these social determinants of health, they will benefit the patient's health and well-being and, and that's a very important and, the financial position of the hospital. While we'd all like to, well, we all would accept that assisting patients in addressing these gaps within their social or support network is the right thing to do. Our data and some of the success stories we'll share will go a long way to clearly illustrating 
that that second point regarding financial position of the hospital uh, is also going to get addressed. The second thesis is that the revenue cycle process, and for many of you, it's you and your teammates that are on this call, are in a great position to play an important role in creating and deploying an entire strategy around addressing these social determinants of health. Based on our review of several industry studies and publicly available information, the identification of patients who need help in addressing one or more of these social determinants of health is not occurring on a consistent basis. Therefore, we believe that RCM is in a great position to create positive change within this area. I think we've all seen this slide in some form of another a thousand times, but it's actually a requirement for anybody doing a presentation to put it in. Um, however, I think it's great to put into a presentation because it forces us all to really think about the finance side of the healthcare equation. Um, it brings into focus that all the money that we spend uh, in the United States, our patient income, our patient outcomes, are not materially better than those of other developed nations. And we are constantly asking ourselves that question, well, why is that? Um, I believe we have some interesting data that we'll share that may allow us to start peeling back that onion to allow us to begin taking positive steps um, in that direction. So remember back to my warning slide. Uh, here comes some of the wonderment and sadness part of, of the discussion. But before we do that, let's start with a common understanding about what actually is a social determinant of health. What is the definition of that? And social determinants of health are economic and social conditions that influence individual and group differences within health status. And if you look at some of these statistics, uh, regarding the United States, some of them are pretty staggering. Um, here we are, one of the most developed nations uh, in the world, and we still have our issues. A million and a half people experience homelessness. Uh, 40 million people face hunger. And 12.5% of the households uh, have some type of food insecurity. And then that middle statistic, about 3.6 million people cannot access medical care due to a lack of transportation. So those are, those are pretty sobering statistics if you think about it uh, in a whole. And I would, would also put forth that I think these statistics uh, are probably a little bit dated given the fact of COVID-19 and what it's done to impact people all across the country. I've added a few slides kind of later in the presentation that I'll speak specifically to COVID-19 and the impact that it's gonna have both immediate, midterm, and long-term. So the actual definition of these social determinants health can at times be somewhat broad. Um, the ones that are listed on this slide generally represent the most widely accepted and impactful social determinants of health. These factors represent the largest gaps within a patient's lives and have a material impact on their overall health. Most publications will agree that the top three are gonna be employment slash income, food and housing. And I think we can all understand how employment slash income kind of has a cascading impact on all of these. Your ability to provide housing or shelter your ability to secure food, and then maybe even you know, get transportation to go to your uh, medical appointments. So employment slash income is, is very important. This is a, another great slide, and throughout the presentation, um, I'll, I'll reference certain slides that I think would be wonderful to share with some of your peers or, or maybe even your CEOs or CFOs of your respective organizations. And I think this slide is one of them. And it's really almost best to read this slide from the bottom up. And it's basically saying that 20% of a individual's overall health and well-being is attributable to their health care. And by that, they mean access and quality of health care. 
the remaining 80% is really can be broken down into behaviors, healthy behaviors, physical environment, and those socioeconomic factors. So income, job status, um, physical environment being housing, all of those other things really outweigh that 20% of the actual access and care that is being delivered. And I think that's pretty, pretty shocking statistic. And I kind of want to reinforce that slide because it is the proverbial 80-20 rule that 20% of the healthy outcomes are determined by clinical care. The rest of them, the 80%, are tied into some other type of factor, physical environment, the social determinants that we've started to cover, and some behavioral factors. So it, it kind of makes you think, in a way, do we have it backwards? Um, it's been several years since I physically actually worked in a hospital, but at the time that I did, it was all about who had the latest this or that, who had the latest technology, who had a laser, who had robotic, the ability to do robotic surgery. You know, we used to call it the arms race. Um, and maybe that's still the case, but seeing a statistic like this really makes you take a step, take a step back and wonder if we're addressing the wrong portion of, uh, of how to effectively deal with the health of a patient. So as I said, I did want to, I went back and I actually uh, added some slides to the presentation because of COVID-19. I mean, clearly this has impacted all of us. Uh, it's impacted our employers, it's impacted the way we conduct business, uh, and it, it's just impacted everything that we have done. And I think it's important that we begin to think about it. This is another great piece of information that I just found so kind of staggering, if you will, if you really take a step back and think about this. And if you look at the columns, uh, it's really addressing the impact of COVID-19 on household income. And again, one of the leading social determinants of health is that income. But the first column talks about the percentage of people that have been laid off or lost a job. Second, had to take a pay cut of some kind. And the third is really a combination or, of, of those two items. And if you really look at that far right column within individuals within those earning years, let's call them 18 to 64, you can see that anywhere from 30 to upwards or close to 50% of those patients or households are being impacted because of COVID-19. And that just is, is, is amazing because of the impact that it's going to have on an individual's ability to address these social determinants of health. Another slide, and I'll do these quickly because I, I just think they're so stunning visually. Um, you know, if you looked at the unemployment rate prior to the virus uh, presenting itself, we were around uh, roughly 3.7% unemployment. And the economy was, was at a level that we had not seen in a long time. The virus presented itself in that second to third week of March, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, and we had unemployment spike 3.3 uh, million. Seven days later, it basically doubled again from an unemployment statistic. And then if you look, if you fast forward a month, that the previous slide was through March, this is through April, we've all seen and heard the unemployment uh, now is approaching 30 million people. And you know that's a that's an eight to ten fold increase in the number of people unemployed in a very very short period of time, and that is just uh, you know that is a gut punch of epic proportion. Now the hope is that the country will begin to reopen, uh, and we're seeing states start to do that now, and we'll see a healthy percentage of the population that's unemployed. Or, begin to go back to work. Um, but some economists have even stated that it's gonna take some time, quite some time, before we see the pre-virus levels. And so I, I emphasize unemployment because of that impact that income has on all of those other areas of social determinants of health. It is a, is a major, major factor. Um, this is a slide I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, 
It represents the states that have and have not expanded Medicaid. And you can see Georgia and your neighboring states within Region 5 um, down there in the lower corner that have not expanded Medicaid. And I'm sure you're dealing with that every day. But I also think it's a great opportunity and time for us to be thinking about how COVID-19 is going to impact Medicaid spending as a whole and what impact that could have on the future of the program and the rules and regulations that are used to kind of guide that program. It's also a great time to begin thinking about um, the impact that it has on your enrollment process. The enrollment process is, is, is going to change, it's going to be stressed, and it's a great time um, to think about how and where that can be approved to include various elements of social determinants of health. The government did pass the CARES Act late in March. Uh, that was the third legislative initiative to begin addressing COVID-19. Uh, I believe the fourth one has passed uh, the House, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some, some wrangling and some negotiating with regards to what that in, eventually ends up to being. But there were a handful of items included within the CARES Act that do begin to address some social determinants of health. There was the reauthorization of some of the programs in the rural areas for Healthy Start and the temporary assistance for needy families. And then a big one that I was very happy to see get addressed was money set aside for food assistance programs. If you think about when the, when the virus kind of hit and people took a step back and what that meant to our lifestyles and things like that, um, school was, was not quite wrapping up. We were kind of in the latter part of the year uh, towards March and you know, kids were still in school. And a lot of children in America receive at least one or maybe two uh, meals via a school sponsored program. And taking that program away because the children were not going to school, um, I think really was a, a shocking event for a lot of people to realize the impact that that would have. So there's 25 billion set aside to, uh, to bolster those programs. Um, there's a part of me that think that that's, that's probably not going to even be enough at that point. And a lot of states are now talking about school will not resume uh, into the fall, so you're going to have that need uh, well into the summer. All right, so let's kind of take a, a quick checkpoint and then we're going to begin kind of honing down and bringing some of these things a little closer to home. So far we put forth, you know, two theses. One was that by identifying and addressing these social determinants of health, by doing so, uh, a hospital can benefit both the patient, the patient's well-being, as well as the finances of the hospital. That's a very important and because the you know, no money, no mission, we have to make sure that we can do that. The second thesis we put forth at the very beginning was that the revenue cycle team um, can play a critical part and creating positive change. Uh, revenue cycle professionals have a strong orientation for process and optimization, and I think this area is gonna be ripe for that. We also know that income, food, and housing are regarded as the, the top three social determinants of health. And we had that one uh, colorful slide about the 80-20 rule, that only 20% of a patient's outcome is directly attributable to the access and execution of that healthcare event, the rest of it is uh, tied up in other social related factors. And then we kind of closed with the insertion of the, of the COVID-19 things uh, and how that will have a uh, immediate mid and long-term impact that we need to be thinking about within this industry of how we're going to do that. So now let's kind of take a look at Georgia specifically uh, and compare it to its uh, neighboring states within Region 5. So anytime you're starting to do a comparison, uh, whether you're doing provider profiling or uh, you know, performance reporting, the first thing you want to do is kind of look at your sample set to make sure that uh, there's a homogeneous population or there's not anything that stands out as a difference 
that would make any comparisons that you would make to be invalid. And so we wanted to look at just a generational spread, which represents age banding uh, within the given states that neighbor Georgia. And as you can see, I've circled Georgia here in the middle. And, and just by quick glance at the, at the colors and the formation of the graphs, you can see that uh, there's, there's not a lot of differences. Uh, if anything, uh, Georgia has a slightly higher amount of Gen Z or millennials, a younger population within their state compared to the others. So theoretically, you could argue that Georgia has a little bit of an advantage because of that um, younger population. But all in all, I think we can make some very, very valid comparisons amongst these states. Let's look at the life expectancy within Georgia and Region 5. Um, some sobering statistics here over the next couple of slides. Um, four out of the five states within Region 5 uh, have a life expectancy that is below the national average of 78.7. Um, so four out of five are not performing uh, at that level. Uh, Georgia is second highest, which is, is good, um, comparatively speaking, at 77.2. But again, um, definitely below the national average. This is a, a very telling slide as well, and it's the percentage of people living below the federal poverty level. Uh, and unfortunately, all five states compare unfavorably to that national average. And they compare, you know, a, a material percentage difference, uh, a little over 3% compared to the national average. And Georgia is right there at 15.6. And I don't have to tell you on this call that, you know, where that line is drawn and how that impacts people's uh, access to all of those social determinants of health uh, is, is income plays a very, very important role in that. So definitely uh, some challenges uh, within this area. We also looked at food insecurity rates uh, among the five states. Uh, and unfortunately, again, all five are above the national average of 12.5. That 12.5 was a, a stat that uh, appeared in, I think, the third or fourth slide as well. But, you know, Georgia is experiencing 14.4% of its population is dealing with some level of food insecurity. And as you can see, compared to the other states, um, uh, it, it's, it's up there and probably a little bit higher than um, we would like to see it. Understanding the impact that food insecurity has on cost. So again, we're always trying to go back to uh, tying how addressing these social determinants of health can impact and eventually improve the finances of a, of a hospital is that patients who are facing food insecurities cost double or two times patients that are properly fed. And that, that's pretty amazing if you think about it, because if you're not properly fed, your ability to leave the hospital and your ability to stay well and not have to come in for a readmission is materially impacted. So that those, those cost factors are just being um, impacted dramatically by those individuals not being properly fed or being uh, nourished at the right levels. I'm not gonna read all of these to you because, but you, know, you can do that. But I will draw, draw your attention to the ones that are kind of in the middle of the slide because you know we're keeping in mind of uh, of the pitch if you will to the CFOs and CEOs of why as, as a hospital or a health system we need to pay attention to social determinants of health and why we need to get on the path to address them and these statistics kind of illustrate that uh, right in your face um, two times the rate of depression 60 percent higher rate of diabetes double the ER visits and double the times uh, that you're more likely to show, be a no-show for an appointment. Um, that, that impacts a hospital's operations, that impacts resource consumption, staffing, uh, everything um, within how a hospital operates. So that in my mind is just a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, validation 
of why it makes sense to begin addressing these concerns. Um, in, in various studies, and I specifically looked at two, um, one from the American Hospital Association and one from Deloitte, a, a vast majority of hospitals have come to understand that addressing these uh, social determinants of health and, and their importance and their quest to become more efficient as a health system and to lower their cost. So they're uh, realizing that they need to address this. This is an important thing. And it's not hard you know, to come to that conclusion when you look at the last two slides where we talked about you know, double this, double that, 60% uh, increases uh, in diabetes and other health conditions. They know hospitals need to begin addressing this. That same survey though uh, was conducted on about a thousand hospitals, large, medium, and small, all across the country, metropolitan, rural, from Maine to Arizona, from uh, Washington to Florida, came up with some, some very interesting findings. 80% um, of the hospitals, uh, the leadership reported that they are committed to developing processes around the identification and the addressing of social determinants of health. That's great news. Um, however, 72% of those same hospitals um, self-reported that they do not have dedicated funds to do this. So uh, it's probably not a common theme or finding within a hospital setting that, you know, problems are everywhere, challenges are everywhere. It's how do we arrange resources and people to begin addressing those challenges. So um, it creates a challenge and it creates a wonderful opportunity. That same study uh, also has some very interesting observations regarding how screenings uh, for patients are conducted and um, the processes surrounding them. And what they found is that there are different tools were being used by different departments. There was a lot of redundancy, a lot of inconsistencies. Um, you know, we're all about the data and multiple data sets created problems in the ability to track outcomes um, and actually reach out to patients. And there was really just a lack of overall process and ownership of who was going to, to manage this. And part of that was actually fed by people and departments meant well. They were trying to do the right thing, but all of the surveys and screenings were being conducted by multiple people. You had nurses, social workers, case management, uh, rev cycle professionals. Uh, they even mentioned some organizations had worked with third-party vendors to begin addressing this specifically. So it, it was kind of a spaghetti bowl, if you will, um, and it was really ripe for uh, somebody to come in, take some ownership, and, and work a process and optimize a process to, uh, to begin addressing this and making it better. But there are a group of hospitals that are kind of leading the charge, if you will, to begin uh, addressing these social determinants of health because they're understanding the financial impact that it's having. Uh, larger hospitals in metropolitan areas were probably the most negatively impacted uh, by patients having these deficiencies in social determinants of health. But on the flip side, they also had better access to community organizations and more of those that provided assistance. Uh, and that's in the area of housing or food and even transportation, you could argue, is a little bit easier to, to manage within a metropolitan environment. So they had their challenges, but they also had some advantages. Uh, Faith-based organizations were also putting a focus in this area, uh, primarily because it fell in, line with, fell in line with their fundamental religious beliefs or their mission uh, to, to help patients uh, at, at all stages uh, regardless uh, of their needs, and to really fulfill that role that uh, they have within the community. And then finally, the third category that was, that was, uh, was leading was what they termed as community flagships. And really, those are hospitals that, that are either the sole provider within a community or within a geographic area, 
and to some degree, they've kind of been thrust into that role because you all know that um, hospitals often serve as the central point of gathering healthcare information and seeking assistance. Uh, and that assistance isn't just when you need to have surgery. Um, if you have a question, you go to the hospital or the hospital has a program for that or they have resources for that. So um, those are often, those community flagship hospitals are kind of being uh, put in that position. You know, why are they leading the charge? Um, besides just being patient focused or mission, or mission, mission driven was the increase in fixed pricing arrangements across various populations. Uh, and those fixed pricing arrangements um, could definitely impact or uh, positively or negatively their performance within those contracts. So the value-based or fixed pricing agreements shift that risk of the patient outcome and their well-being to the hospital. And I think we're only going to see this increase um, year over year within the healthcare segment. Um, and I also believe it's a great opportunity for a paradigm shift for if you kind of take a step back and think about how would a health system, a hospital, look at and begin addressing social determinants of health if 100% of the patients that they were seeing were structured within a capitated environment. So that patient, that hospital was going to receive X amount of dollars for that patient and they're out, they were on the hook for that outcome would they be focusing on things that they, uh, that 80% that allowed that patient to remain healthy. All right, uh, I definitely wanted to share some success stories for, uh, with the group because uh, I wanted to be uplifting and provide a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but I also think there's some great ways to uh, further the, the correlation between activity and the finance uh, impact of that. The first one that I wanted to share with you is a, a Midwest ACO. They put forth a very conscious effort to address food insecurities at the time of admission. So if a patient was identified as being malnourished or having food issues, uh, they were flagged at that time of, of admission and they were tracked all the way through the time of discharge. At the time of discharge, they were provided food resources for a specified period of time to kind of get them through that period that we saw the other stats about uh, readmission rates and longer hospitalizations. And the financial results were, were pretty impressive. Uh, they saved about $3,800 per patient and the readmission rate uh, saw a dramatic reduction that totaled close to $5 million. So again, I think this is a great one because you'll notice uh, the initial flag was done at the time of admission. And I think that uh, creates an opportunity for uh, revenue cycle professionals to insert themselves in that process. The second one, this health system was actually in Illinois. So a little bit, uh, a little bit north of Georgia, but they targeted uh, the populations that we're all aware of and that would be the frequent flyers. Uh, I know there's various terms out there, but I think frequent flyers is, is one that's used most, uh, most readily. But these were frequent flyers into the emergency room. And they identified approximately 200 patients and they uh, tracked those patients, screened them, and found that the common variable uh, or catalyst for them coming into the ED was the, uh, the lack of housing. And they were able to partner with a state-sponsored uh, resource that helped provide some housing solutions for those patients. And they also saw dramatic cost uh, reduction. The cost dropped by about 60%. Uh, ER rates dropped materially as well, as you can see. And another benefit that they were able to see was that it created some stability within that patient population and they were able to change the manner in which those patients accessed the healthcare system. So they saw an increased use of clinics and physicians. So um, they weren't bombarding the 
the ED uh, and viewing that as their primary way to begin accessing healthcare. Uh, the next example is related to transportation. And if you'll remember early on, we had this statistic uh, of 3.6 million people um, do not have uh, access to transportation and that causes them to miss appointments um, and delay the delay seeking or actually receiving care. And the price tag that was put on that was about $150 billion. So uh, one study found that by helping them uh, access transportation, you can get material reductions in those mixed missed appointments, uh, as well as improving the overall patient uh, and physician satisfaction. Because a missed appointment, you know, there's, there's losers all the way around. Uh, the patient is not getting care. It's disrupting scheduling within a hospital, either at the physician level or even you know, elective surgeries or what have you. So it has a cascading impact for sure. A lot of hospitals have begun addressing this and, and they do a good job, either through sponsorship of their own program, their own transportation uh, van of some kind, or partnering with uh, ride sharing services such as uh, Uber or Lyft. So this is one I think the industry has, has kind of done a good job of, of beginning to address. So I'm sure you know, every hospital would just love to uh, address all these deficiencies and, and opportunities. We have to be realistic that uh, the, the healthcare and hospital world is in constant change. Uh, the one thing that is constant is change. You know, we're seeing the creation of multi-facility systems due to the result of mergers and acquisitions. We're seeing you know, larger facilities uh, either buying or partnering with smaller facilities to increase their footprint or even extend you know, high-end clinical services. You're seeing integration of urgent care facilities into small or mid-sized systems as they continue to, to, to put their fingerprints out into the community at a broader basis. And I think we all have either or have gone through this or have heard of going through this is the integration of physician practices, both from a process and technology standpoint into the health system. So with all that change, I think you can look at it one of two ways. Are you a half glass, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Some would say, oh my goodness, you know, that's chaos. Now is not the time to address this. This is too much. Others could look at it as an opportunity because when all of these pieces and parts are, are being broken in or reorganized into a more cohesive process, now is the time to embed or overlay an identification and screening process and an assistance process for all of those social determinants of health. Um, you know, with that landscape changing and constantly changing, uh, there's some great gut check questions that we can ask. You know, back to that one slide, the the eighty twenty rule. Um, you know, we really have to we really have to ask ourselves. Um, you know, are we using technology effectively? Are we coordinating amongst all the departments within our hospital? Uh, there's a lot of of well purposed individuals trying to do the right thing. It may just be um, you know due to a lack of coordination. Uh, do we have a plan? And and most importantly, we need to make sure that, that patients aren't getting lost in, in our lack of process or our lack or our or disorganization. Um, the fundamental reason why we're there is to help those patients. And are they getting lost in that entire, entire thing? All right, so let's begin to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to kind of provide a handful of just concrete steps that individuals can take to, uh, to begin addressing uh, social determinants of health. I think first and foremost, it begins with, with education. You know, there's a, a handful of slides that we've covered today that have some great, great statistics on them that you know, would be wonderful items to share with the CEOs and CFOs of hospitals. Um, every CEO is looking for a patient success story for the next board meeting. And what CFO is not looking for some type of cost savings? 
Um, and I think we've illustrated by success stories and some other statistics, there is a direct tie by addressing these social determinants of health and the cost structure uh, and resource consumption within a hospital. The second thing is I think we should all take inventory of, your, of the efforts that are currently taking place. I think odds are you're gonna find that somebody's doing something. Um, the issue and the opportunity is that it's probably being done inconsistency, inconsistently, and it, it suffers from a lack of process. And again, that's a great opportunity for RCM professionals to shine. Um, and I think it's a wonderful thing to, to understand what resources are available within your community. You know, take inventory of what's out there that you can marry up um, with the patients that you're identified as having um, a need. I inserted this slide kind of, uh, I debated back and forth because it cuts up a little bit of the action items, but I think it's, it's, it's a great, great piece of information um, to show just the sheer volume that we're dealing with and the sheer opportunity that we have. So I would call your attention over to that right column under the star and then down by the arrows, those last two boxes. And really what it's saying is that for states that didn't expand Medicaid, 96% of the people or the patients who qualified for Medicaid also qualified for some additional benefit. And some of those benefits, not all of them, I've listed over to the left, such as you know, food stamps or home or energy assistance or uh, telephone assistance or internet or, or whatever, what have you. Um, those programs, 96% of the people qualified for that additional benefits. But then right below that, there's always that percentage of population that are just slightly above the income level or for whatever reason in your state, they just, they barely miss qualifying for Medicaid. Even for those individuals, 78% stay qualified for some of these assistance programs. So if you, if you, if you boil that down, 75% of that population or that socioeconomic grouping of people that are coming in, three out of four, could benefit from some of those programs that are offered within various states. So kind of back to action steps, I, I just thought that that kind of brings it home that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an environment rich for opportunity to, uh, to provide assistance. Um, once you kind of understand and peel back that onion to understand what your current process is or isn't, you know, begin assigning specific roles within the hospital. Uh, understand how specific departments um, can work together. Maybe you can consolidate some of those functions within uh, a various department. Uh, instead of three independent efforts, maybe that can be consolidated with when, within one um, consolidated way or, or single process. Um, I think also, and I've hit uh, several times that, you know, revenue cycle professionals are very good at this. Uh, it's your time to shine. Uh, begin developing these processes, um, begin, begin breaking it down, uh, mapping it out. It's a great time to do that. And when doing so, I would just um, caution everybody to think a little bit bigger back to the one slide that we talked about, constant change and integration of, health, uh, of a health system. Uh, be thinking that it's, you know, make sure that your screening process and your identification process grabs uh, patients as they enter the health system, regardless of where it is. Uh, where are those thousand points of light? In the inpatient environment, the outpatient, physicians, urgent care. When they enter, when they come in, how are we identifying and screening them uh, for possible applications? We can't forget about technology. Um, you know, technology just changes so rapidly. Um, how can technology be used? To, uh, to throw a wide net around this. Technology can be wonderful from a data collection standpoint because you know, back to you can't manage what you can't measure and you wanna be able to walk into a CEO or CFO's hospital and show them the impact that you've had with your beta test uh, of looking at uh, frequent flyers within the ED. Uh, technology can play a, a big part of that. Um, and it also, you know, I would say it takes a village. Um, get your, your vendors or your partners involved. 
oftentimes we all get focused in what do I have to do this week? What do I have to do this month? What about this quarter? Pretty soon you lift your head and it's the years gone by and technology changes and uh, services and the vendors or your partners offer change. So, you know, have that conversation the next time you're with them about, hey, we need to start addressing this. Do you have any tools or can you provide assistance uh, in, into this area? And then just overall things to keep in mind, you know, as you start down the path, make sure you establish measurement strategies. Um, start someplace. Um, don't try and boil the ocean. Uh, start with a small program. Um, evaluate how it's going, what's succeeding, what's failing. Make adjustments. And then, you know, most importantly, share your successes and, and probably just as importantly, share your failures, uh, share your struggles. HFMA provides just a tremendous platform uh, to build relationships with peers uh, via email or uh, social media or conferences to, uh, to really understand um, what has worked and what hasn't. So, you know, maximize that platform as you begin this journey. And I think, you know, in closing, everybody needs to keep in mind that if you help one person or one family uh, in identifying or addressing these gaps in, in social determinants of health, you are positively changing that individual's lives. And not a lot of professions have that opportunity. And it's one that we should not take lightly within healthcare. So, um, you know, hopefully what we've covered today uh, has, has been informative. It's given you an appreciation for the impact that social determinants have on a patient uh, and uh, just as importantly, the finances within the healthcare system. Um, and with that, Lori, uh, I'd be happy to take a couple questions in the time that we have left. Okay, great. All right, I mean, we do have a couple of questions queued up here and I'll just quickly remind everyone, if you have a question for Rodney, please use the Q&A box and um, submit it that way and we'll, we'll ask. Uh, first question or here, with regard to new nutrition, how are some physician groups or hospitals partnering with local food banks to provide foods necessary for patients? Who's shouldering the, the load for the cost of food and access? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, a lot of it revolves around the communication. You know, every, every community is going to be different. Every community is going to have uh, access and extent of resources that are available. So I've seen some physician groups, you know, once they identify that there is a food insecurity or, or food needs to be addressed, um, when that patient is actually in for a visit or leaving for a visit, they're providing information that connect the individual to those resources. So it could be as simple as a trifold, it could be a, a single page uh, within their chart or, or whatever, but just uh, really trying to, to tie those two together so that they can help solve that need. Okay. In your transportation slide, it referenced using Uber to help decrease no-shows by 10%. Who pays the Uber? If it was the hospital, what did they spend to improve the no-show by 10%? Um, I'll have to go back and check that actual case study. Um, I'm pretty confident that the hospital did uh, you know, foot the bill for that. Um, and I think the way they tracked the impact of that was just a, a point in time or a period of time of before they implemented that program, the no-shows and the cancellations that they had compared to what they had, you know, after implementing that program. So, and I've seen several hospitals do this um, actually throughout the country in, in all settings, um, metropolitan uh, as well as rural as uh, tying them to some type of transportation service. Rodney, um, if you'd like, what we can do is if you can get those stats, if they're easy to get access to, if you can shoot those to me, and I'll just include that in the email follow-up that I send to the attendees on Friday. Absolutely. Yeah, I have access to uh, the case study, and I can, um, maybe we can put the complete case study out there. Um, maybe interesting reading for some of the people. Okay. Can you please clarify how social determinants of health can impact Medicaid enrollments? 
Um, I was just trying to make the tie that, you know, if you kind of work your way backwards, um, you know, income level is a, a big determinant in, in states as to if an individual qualifies for Medicaid. Uh, obviously, each state varies a little bit. But with um, the unemployment uh, rising and income levels dropping due to loss of job or um, pay being reduced, that's going to impact the number of people that may qualify for Medicaid. No different than when we see the economy going well. Um, typically, the percentage of self-pay and Medicaid enrollment tends to drop. When that flips, um, we tend to see Medicaid enrollment and access to these um, social determinants of health assistance programs rise. So it, it's the proverbial seesaw that as one goes up, uh, the other will go down and vice versa. Right. If you had to pick one area or approach to begin addressing social determinants of health, which one would you choose? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I love that question. Um, if it was me, I would probably pick the, uh, the, the frequent flyer example, the, the frequent flyers into the ED. And here's the reason I think I would pick that is I think it's an issue that every hospital, regardless of size, can identify with. Um, everybody, everybody has that uh, cross-section of population. The data is, is readily available to identify those individuals that uh, are high users of the emergency room. You don't need a huge data set to measure the impact, nor do you need to have a, a massive longitudinal study of six months or a year or whatever to manage or to, to really see the impact. Um, you can see that impact quickly and you can pick 25, 50, you know, you can, you can scale it to the size of your uh, hospital to really, um, to, to conduct a study that still represents meaningful results because it just rolls downhill. You know, if you, if you divert those people, the ED is very costly, uh, costly resources. And uh, by eliminating that, it's just a benefit to everybody. Okay. Do you feel any of the three hospital types, uh, large metro, faith-based, flagship, that are leading, leading the charge, do they have a clear advantage over the others in addressing social determinants of health? Mm. Uh, another, another good question. Um, I would say, you know, kind of as we talked about, there's, there's, each of them has their, their challenge and opportunity. There's, there's not a large difference probably between one or the other. Um, if I was forced to pick one, I would probably say that faith-based um, hospital systems might have a slight advantage because it already falls in line with their mission, their vision, their culture to, to reach a handout uh, to all of those individuals that may be impacted by uh, food insecurity or housing issues or uh, transportation and getting to appointments. Uh, it's a little bit more ingrained within that culture. Um, but I don't think the differences are that vast because uh, each one is dealing with their own set of uh, pros and cons, if you will. Okay, the last question I have here. If a hospital doesn't have a large number of fixed pricing arrangements, do you believe that the financial impact can still be material? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I, I think uh, uh, again, I think fixed pricing arrangements will continue to, to continue to permeate throughout healthcare. But even without those, I think your the overall cost savings to a hospital is something that can be gleaned from uh, from addressing these. We've already talked about you know staffing the ED for the people that come in you know five times a week. Well, that ain't cheap. You know, that, 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 that consumes resources and, and salary dollars. Um, a reduction in readmissions obviously impacts a hospital and their, their scores that they need to report. 
and getting length of stay in line with expectations uh, because of food issues that can be addressed um, is something that hospitals will see the benefit. So it may not be directly attributable to performance within a fixed pricing agreement, but I think it's going to maybe be a little bit more heavily weighted on um, positively impacting the cost equation. Okay, great. All right. Okay, uh, uh, that wraps up the questions that we have here. Rodney, thanks a lot. Uh, before we drop off, everyone, just a reminder that next Wednesday will be the last in our weekly webinar, weekly Wednesday webinar series. Say that three times fast. So please be sure to join us at, when, at 1 p.m. And actually, next week's webinar is really ap appropriate for the Memorial Day week. It's Veteran Affairs Claims, What Does 2020 Hold? And um, also I mentioned earlier that tomorrow we'll be hosting a, a virtual networking event. So please be sure to join us for that. You can register for all of these on the events calendar. And we are gonna be publishing the slate of webinars for June and July. So we'll, we'll stay with the Wednesday theme, but be going to twice a month. And uh, we'll be publishing that slate of webinars for June and July very soon. Thanks everybody for, for participating today. And Rodney, thanks very much for sharing your expertise. We'll be posting the presentation. Um, you already have the link to it. So it's out on the HFMA website, as well as the recording by the end of the week. And as Rodney and I just talked about, he has a couple of additional pieces that he'll share and uh, watch for an email later this week, Friday, uh, for that information. Thanks again, Rodney. Th Rodney, thanks again, everyone else. Stay safe and have a great afternoon.